end time explosions of truth with Apostle Takim. It's been said, if you want to get married, sow a seed. But God has sent Apostle Takim to tell us, if you want to get married, come into my manifest presence. It's been said, if you want to be free from any work of the devil, sow a seed. But God has sent Apostle Takim to tell us, if you want to be free from every work of the devil, come into my manifest presence. It's been said, if things are not okay with you, it's your foundation that is responsible or some altars in your village. But God has sent his teaching prophet to tell us, if things are not okay with you, it is the foundation of the Lord that is missing in your life. The Cry of the Spirit Ministries in Nairobi presents Moment of Grace and Truth, the prophetic and apostolic teaching ministry of Richard E. S. Takim. We cannot stop screaming the rumblings of the Holy Ghost to the ears of our generation. Now, follow us to the sanctuary. Pick your Bible while you are standing and open to Psalm 118. For I need Jesus now more than ever. For we need Jesus now more than ever. Psalm 118 verse 19. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them. And I will praise the Lord. There can be no authentic praise until we go through the gates of righteousness. I told you yesterday, the second day of this very conference, that the revival that we are expecting is called the revival of righteousness. The next statement says, This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter, not the wicked. The righteous. We are going to ask this morning, Lord, open unto me again the gates of righteousness. Let portals of righteousness be open. Those are the gates. Open your mouth and pray. Let portals of righteousness be open in my spirit, in my soul. As I sit under this ministration, let portals of righteousness be open. Open unto me the gates. The gates of righteousness through which I need to go through. Maliba Satale Kayabo said Open unto me the gates of righteousness through which I need to go through. Open your mother prayer. Open unto me the gates of righteousness, Lord. Open unto me the gates of righteousness. As I sit under this ministration. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, I bring everyone under the sound of my voice this very moment into your hands. I pray, O oh God, that as your word comfort, you will pour your holiness in our hearts. You will pour your revelation even to the worst person who don't know anything about you. You will open our ears and our hearts to comprehend the scriptures in the name of Jesus. I take authority over every spirit of hell that may be sitting over anyone under the sound of my voice right now. And I command that let the gates of hell not prevail against you. In the name of Jesus, let the intention of God for this world be executed. Because his word is not permitted to return to him vowed. Without accomplishing the reason why he sent it. Therefore, let his word accomplish why he sent it in your life this very moment. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for you are a good God. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. May have your seat. Hallelujah. And welcome to this very special meeting in the name of Jesus. I am going to bring a prophetic word that the Lord gave me this very day. It's like out of the flow of the conference that we started. This is a prophetic word. 
Sometimes God comes in with a word to break the flow of things, to bring out something of urgent attention. And this morning, I will be speaking on what I titled, Which Heaven Are You Going To? Which one? Tell your neighbor, ask your neighbor, which heaven are you going to? If you didn't hear, you ask the person on your on the other side, which heaven are you going to? Let me begin by talking about the destinations after death. From the mouth of the judge of all. The judge of all is not the chief justice of any supreme court on the face of the earth. The judge of all is Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In his own court, the voice of the people is not the voice of God. But in the court of public opinion, the voice of the people is the voice of God. <laughs> but in the court of the judge of all, the voice of the people is never the voice of God. That was why he made it clear in 1 Kings chapter 22 or so that 400 prophets were prophesying a lie. Only one spoke the truth. And the one that spoke the truth, his word came to pass. So from the mouth of the judge of all, I don't care what people think about Jesus. Some call him a prophet. Others call him the founder of Christian religion. Some call him a criminal who died for his own sins. Some call him a wonderful personality that showed up on the face of the earth. To some of the East Jews today, Jesus is a major agency of tourism attraction. Because of him, they are making a lot of money in Israel. People go there every year. But I don't care what people think about who this man is. In the day of judgment, we are all going to appear before him and it will be clear to everybody he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. He is the judge of all. He is the judge of all. One good thing about Jesus, the Bible says he's going to sit on the, white, the throne of judgment, the great white throne judgment. One thing about this judge of all, he came to mankind, he came to sinners, to leak out his judgment to sinners before the day of judgment. <laughs> Do you understand me? Before the day of judgment, he came and leaked it out to us and said, this is how I am going to judge. So that we can align ourselves. Why did he do that? Where the Bible says he's not willing that anybody should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So that is why it's very important that we identify the destinations after death from the mouth of this judge. John chapter 3 verse 16 said something very beautiful. Let's go there. John 3 16. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you look at two key words here, perish, everlasting life, those words show us that there are two definite, defined, uncompromising destinations after death. There are no three destinations after death. There's no one destination after death. There are just two destinations after death. The next word says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. I told you before, it's because the world is condemned already. But that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he, is not be because he did not believe in the name of the only begotten son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because they are this world evil. For everyone practicing evil hates light and does not come to light. Least is this be exposed. So from this scripture, we can see two definite, defined destinations. Are you understanding me? Two definite, defined destinations. And if you look at Matthew chapter 7, from what the judge of all said, Matthew chapter 7, quickly, let's go there. Verse 13, 
Look at what he said. He said, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go into it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So from this scripture, we can see two destinations. The one of the destination is called the place of destruction. The other one is called the place of life. Are you understanding me? These are the two destinations. And this very scripture now tells us there are two pathways that lead to these very two destinations. That right now on the face of the earth, every human being is following one of them. As you are hearing me this very moment, you are either in the pathway that lead to destruction or the pathway that lead to life. There is no middle ground. Either you are a pastor, a prophet or not, or an unbeliever or an imam or whoever you are, you are either in the pathway that leads to damnation or the pathway that leads to life. Every human on the face of the earth is planted on either of these pathways. Blessed are you if God will open your eyes to see the pathways that you are traveling in. Before your eyes close in death. So Jesus made it clear that there are two pathways that leads to these two destinations. He now went on again to give us a more elaborate revelation in Luke 16. So look at the book of Luke chapter 16 verse 19. He said there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from, from the rich man's table. He now said, moreover, the dust came and licked the sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. So you see another destination. The rich man also died and was buried. Two destinations. You get my point? As described by Jesus. So the poor man died and went to Abraham's bosom. A description of one of the destinations called everlasting life. Called life. Are you understanding me? And the wrong one died and was buried. And the Bible says in the next word. And being in torment, in hate, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So you see the two destinations here. So, one of it, we can get it clearer now. Clary is calling a hate. Hate is the abode of the dead. You get my point? And you see Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. Before then, Abraham has died. The word bosom means quarter, extension. Are you understanding me? And I want you to understand this clearly. That Jesus came into time to show us these destinations that every soul goes to as soon as eyes are closed in death. Are you understanding me? And I told you he did this because he doesn't want anybody to perish. So this very one called Abraham Bosom is a destination of life. The other one called hate is a destination of destruction. Eternal destruction. Now, let's go further to another scripture that further made everything clear. I call it the revelation of the destinations by Jesus. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verse 42. Mark chapter 9, verse 42. The Bible says, And whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, God help us. I just hope preachers are reading this scripture. Because when you preach a lie that sends someone to hell, you are in trouble. You say, and whoever caused one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a milestone were hung around his neck and were thrown to the sea. And if your hand makes you sin, cut it off. He's not talking about the physical hand. He's talking about relationship. Any relationship, it could be somebody you are cohabitating with and you have given back to 250 children. God is saying, if that will lead you to hell, cut it off. He now went on to say, it is better for you to enter into life maimed. So you see one destination called life. 
It means it's better for me to go to heaven without my family than to go to hell with my family. <laughs> Do you understand me? He said, he said, he said, it's better to, to he says it's better for you to enter into life, ma'am, than having two hands to go into hell, to go to hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. So you see, the, the destinations are becoming clearer, clearer. The first one is a place of life. And Jesus said it's very, very important to pay any price. Even though it involves cutting any kind of relationship from your life, it's very critical that you pay any price to make sure you end into the right destination when your eyes close in death. Because it will be useless for you not to pay any price, gain all the relationship you can, and not end into that destination called hell. And Jesus described that destination as a place of fire, and the fire cannot be quenched. It cannot be quenched. Look at the way he described it again in verse 44. He said, where there are worms does not die. And the fire is not quenched. So everybody who have seen this destination comes to report on how some big worms are in that destination called hell. And they chew people, they chew the souls of men and create a lot of pain pains in their lives it's not talking about these little worms you see in fishes or little worms you see where things are decayed it's talking about big eternal worms that eat the souls of men a combination of the worms and the fire in the same place not for one week not for two weeks for eternity forever and ever and ever it's not a place that you say by tomorrow i'm going to come out by next tomorrow i'm going to come out it's a place that you'll be there forever and ever so if there's anybody in our families that ever close are in debt and went to this place maybe they died 150 years ago they have been in this place for 150 years and that is just the beginning because at the end of time, when judgment will be concluded, they will now be transported to the hottest part called the lake of fire. So if you see Jesus telling us to pay any price, if being single is a price, pay it. Do you understand my point? If being poor is a price, pay the price. Because you see, if being poor is the price, you need to pay to escape this place. Jesus said, pay it. Preachers are saying something different. But Jesus is saying, you pay it. Now, you better listen to Jesus who is the judge of all, not the preacher who tells you, gain the whole world, don't bother about your soul. And Jesus said, no. If you gain the whole world and lose your soul, what shall it profit you? There are two destinations as soon as your eyes close in death. Two destinations. He went on in verse 45 and said, If your foot makes you sin, cut it off. What is food? Place you are always going. Places you always go, either physically or mentally, through your Facebook or YouTube, or you go physically. If such visit will make you to go to hell, Jesus says, Stop. It is better for you to enter life lame. If going to U.S. will take you to hell, stay in Africa. It's better for you to remain in your village and not travel anywhere in the world and die and go to heaven than to travel through the whole world and die and go to hell. That's the meaning of lame. That means you, you have not been to anywhere in the world. Maybe you just from your village and came to Nairobi and that is the last place. And Jesus said, if that one will make you go to heaven, you better remain in Nairobi. You better remain lame than, he said, than having two feet. That means a record of you travel the whole world. Then and be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Look at verse 47. And if your eyes make your, you sin, that is what you see, your side, things that takes your attention, he said, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye, with one focus on heaven, with one focus on eternal things. 
that you have your attention divided than having two eyes to be cast into the lake of fire. The truth is this. Nobody can go to heaven with two eyes. You have to blind one eye to the world. You have to blind your eye to the systems of this world. You have to blind your eyes to the pleasure of this world. Or else you cannot make heaven. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? You have to walk on the street. And when your friend tells you, can you see that beautiful woman? You say, I'm not seeing. I am blind. Can you see that beautiful car? I am not seeing. I am blind. If Eve was blind in the garden that way, there would be no fall of man. She saw everything, saw the fruit that Jesus said they shouldn't eat. And, and after she saw, she lay all on it and ate. And look at where we are today. So check our lives. We are broken because of we refuse to blind our eyes to things that will destroy. Are you understanding me? He said, we should not go to this destination where there are worms does not die, verse 48, and the fire is not quenched. So, if you look at what the judge of all has said to us in his word, he said there are two destinations. There is hell and there is heaven. And he went further to tell us, if you want to go to the better destination where there will be peace, where you will live with your God and enjoy life for everlasting, he said, hey, there's a pathway to follow. It is called the narrow way. But if you want to go to that destination, there's also a pathway. It's called the broad way. A place of no standard. If you want to get married, don't worry about the standard. Marry anyhow. If you want to go into business, go anyhow. It's a pathway of no standard. A pathway of church without standard. Christianity without standard. Are you understanding me? Let me show you a major plague today. I will build on some revelations I gave yesterday on the dragon pools. There are dragon pools called churches in our age and time. The, the Bible example of dragon pool, we can get it from the scripture we saw yesterday. First King chapter 22. First King chapter 22 verse 37 look at what it says it says so the king died referring to ahab and was brought to samaria and they buried the king in samaria then someone washed the chariots or at the pool in samaria and the dogs licked up his blood while they weird while the harlots bathed according to the word of the Lord, which he has spoken. So I told you yesterday, there are two dragon pools, which I revealed yesterday. There are more than two in scripture, but I show you just two. The first one is a pool where the unborn generation is killed. A place where we saw Joab and Abner telling the young men to come and stand and fight, and they kill themselves. And I told you, if you look at the nations of the earth, there are two major political parties in every nation that practice democracy. That represent Abna and Joab. So each of the political parties check each time they are in conflict. Each time they are in, in, in conflict with each other. Who do they use to protest? The youth. We are yet to see 75-year-old people carrying placards on the street protesting for a political party. It's always the future generation that they always push because the agenda is to kill them and stop the birth of the unborn generation. That's what we saw yesterday. Now, hear this. This very second pool that I, 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 we, we read about is called the pool of moral corruption. And the Bible says it is where harlots bait. And I told you that this is a dragon pool. And this is a kind of thing that we call church. Where harlots bait. A harlot is he that have no sexual boundaries. There are two definitions of harlotry. There's the natural one. Someone who has no sexual boundaries. And he used 
his sexual or her sexual drive to gain economic fatness or gain comfort or overcome problems of life are you understanding me so if you see churches today that there is no sexual standard from the pulpit to the pew some sorry things that are happening that we just we just we in fact there's no difference between us and the world system are you understanding me why because most of our churches are simply the pool of dragons and i want to go back to the scripture i normally read here first Samuel chapter 22 let's see a pool of dragon that was constructed in the days of the bible constructed outwardly it was called shiloh it was called better it was called the house of god but spiritually it was a pool of harlots a pool of moral corruption where harlots come to bait like i said any church that is a pool of the dragon that is a pool of moral corruption the revelation that goes out there the teaching the preaching that goes out there are preachings that only harlot christians can enjoy they go there and bait so long as you can tell the man who is living with a woman that is not his wife that you are going to heaven he listens to you it's such people are the ones that come to such churches and bait in the in the teachings of the churches you get my point when you so long as the, the pastor allow the man to keep staying with the woman he's not legally married with or allow the woman to keep staying with the man that is not legally married with it's okay church continue fat tight is being brought Brought. that is a pool of the dragon or as soon as two people say they want to marry themselves the next thing either the man move from his own house to the woman's house and start living or the woman move from her own house to the man's house and start living and they still come to church sad enough most of them are even pastors and they call them some are even bishops they call themselves bishops call themselves pastors so they say we are in relationship and they keep living together sometimes bearing children and when anything happens they disorganize the thing come to an end and they will call it a broken relationship is better than a broken marriage who is deceiving who what is the standard of the kingdom a church that allows such nonsense to happen is a dragon pool it's a place where harlots bait. A place where harlots bait. Are you understanding me? Any church you attend that you are comfortable in sexual perversion. You are comfortable with any kinds of sin. And they pamper you and you go there and you get excited. Nobody talk about the sin you are living in. That place is a place where harlots are baiting. Are you understanding me? People are not interested with relationship with, of, in relationship with God. They are not interested in the sound doctrine. All they want is a miracle that God can provide. And people are comfortable in such places that is a dragon pool first Samuel chapter 2 look at one of the dragon pools in the bible verse 22 now Eli was very old and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting so he said why do you do such thing for I hear of your evil de dealings from all the people you see in the in the bible is an evil dealing for a preacher to be sleeping with anybody especially their church members in the bible is an evil dealing for a lady to agree to sleep with a so-called preacher it's an evil dealing for a woman to come to church and the first vision is how to marry the pastor or marry the prophetess that is an evil dealing that is a pool of harlots and the bible said they were doing it they were doing it until they hit a point where god gave them up to their vile passions he no longer restrained them or restrict them and they now see it as part of it when god no longer restrain you you will no longer be chastised for your wickedness whenever god no longer restrain you when he gives you up to your vile passion or your sin whatever you do he will not rebuke you again he will not chastise you again at that point judgment is about hitting 
That was what happened to these people. Check the body of Christ, the things we do as so-called pastors, the things we do as Christians, because God is not rebuking us. So we take it as, oh, we, this is it. Nothing is wrong with this thing. We don't know that we are sitting on a time bomb of divine judgment. Because when God no longer rebuke you or chastise you for your wickedness, you are no longer a son. You are being dismissed from the family spiritually. That is why you wonder, why is this pastor, you know very well, why is he sleeping with his sister, getting her pregnant and aborting the child, and God is doing nothing about it. God is doing nothing about it because you call the person a pastor, but before God is a big harlot who is betting in the pool of, 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 of the dragon, and God has given him up, God is no longer interested. The person has been dismissed from the family, but you call him my father in the Lord. May such a preacher not be a father in the Lord to you. Because you'll be father to hell. You'll be father to hell. Are you understanding me? So that was who the sons of Eli was. As a result, even when their father spoke to them, the Bible said they could not listen because God desired to slay them. Not that God sealed their mind not to listen to their father. Rather, God has already given them up because they have gotten to a point where they can no longer listen. Listen carefully. The same pool that was in First Samuel is right now with us today in the church. Are you understanding me? If you look at verse 35, what, sorry, verse, verse 25, the father continues saying, if one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Who will intercede for him? He now went to say, nevertheless, they do not hear the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. Only people who hear the voice of God can listen to the voice of spiritual fathers. Do you understand me? Verse, verse 26 says, and the child somewhere grew in stature and in favor, both with the Lord and with men. God is sending this word to warn the unruly in the body of Christ. He's also sending this word to encourage the Samuel generation that are caught up in the midst of the pool of perversion. He's telling you, keep separating yourself from evil. Keep pressing into me because I am going to use you to replace the perverted bishops, the perverted apostles and the prophets. I will use you to replace the prophetess that sleep with men who came to her for prayers. I will use you to replace all this perversion in the body look at what the bible says he said there in verse 35 everyone to verse 35 then i will raise up for myself a faithful praise may you be a faithful praise in the name of jesus we shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind i will build him a show house and it shall walk before my anointed which is god forever the anointed is a pre-incarnate christ in that scripture are you understanding me so the dragon pools will be replaced. But let me show you how did the church come to a point where instead of being a place where people bathe in the clean waters of truth, the clean waters of righteousness, why did it get to a point that people now bathe in the waters of moral decadence? The waters of all kinds of pollutions where there are no standard. The kind of blindness eyes in the body of Christ today is so painful. It's so, it's, it's so alarming. You see Christians will live anyhow thinking they will make heaven. The greatest surprise on the face of the earth is not a surprise that you lost a dear one. It's not a surprise that oh maybe the plane is about to crash. The, the greatest surprise in the world is when you close your eyes in death thinking that you are going to make heaven and you get there and it tells you get deep behind me for I know you not. That is the greatest surprise. It is called surprise in eternity. And the Lord showed me a vision where a lot of Christians with their Bibles are marching to hell. I thought it was a joke. Until when you read newspapers, you hear reports of what's happening in the church, you become alarmed. You mean these people think they are going to heaven like this? What some time ago I read a report, a so called woman in relationship with a so called pastor sleeping together, living together, 
to the point of giving birth to a child and they say we are going to get married and the pastor was still courageous to be coming to church to preach in that wickedness that wicked sin you get my point and things went very bad and then the woman now decided to take away her life in her state of committing suicide she still claimed she will make heaven what kind of a church do we have today? A people that are marching to hell and yet they don't know? And yet they don't know? Somebody will be in so-called relationship sleeping with a man and a woman and you still come to church singing the choir, collect communion and think you will go to heaven when they ask you, who are you? I am Takim, Holy Ghost filled, speaking in tongues, nonsense. And you are living such a life, you say you are going to heaven. Multitude, multitude are on the pathway that leads to eternal damnation. It's so sad that they are in the church, not even in the world, in the church. In the church. And God wants that number reduced quickly. How did we come to this point? Let me give you the first way we came here. Look at first Samuel chapter 2 verse 12 how do we have the pools of dragon called churches today first i want to two verse 12 he said now the sons of eli were corrupt number one corruption moral corruption are you understanding me that is the first reason number two the bible says they do not know the lord lack of intimate knowledge of god these are the two reasons that we came to this place. I will show you others. Lack of intimate knowledge. The sons of Ella represent the preachers. You see, like the people will always look like the preachers they listen to. Everybody will always look like the preacher is listening to. That's just the truth. So the decay began from leadership. The Bible says the church got to this point because we produce spiritual leaders that are corrupt. They are corrupt. Corrupt with the love of money. Corrupt with sexual passions. Corrupt with all kinds of filth and sinfulness because they are corrupt. As a result, the churches they brought forth became pools of the dragon and two because they lack intimate knowledge of god you can know about jesus without really knowing jesus it's a difference between knowing and knowing about so there was no intimate knowledge no preacher can produce a righteous breed if he is corrupt or he lack intimate knowledge of god are you understanding me and the next reason why we came here is in jeremiah chapter 23 why the church got to this point jeremiah 23 verse 21 quickly open your bibles there jeremiah 23 look at what the bible says he said i have not sent this prophet yet the round i have not spoken to them yet they prophesy so the third reason why we came here is we have an army of preachers that have no legitimacy in the spirit they lack legitimacy. God has not sent them. They went into ministry. He has not spoken to them. They opened their mouth to preach. When you preach, when God has not spoken to you, your preaching will produce moral decadence. It will never change anybody. You could read a book from a preacher to preach. You could listen to a sermon and duplicate. But whatever you are doing cannot produce impact in men. It will give back to a group of people that think they know God while they don't know him. Are you understanding me? So the Bible says, you have not sent them, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesy. Verse 22, but if they have stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they will have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. What is the counsel of the Lord? Don't go into ministry in corruption. Don't go into ministry without intimate knowledge with, with of me that is why why jesus spoke to the disciples when he gave us the great commission he said he said come i come teach them the things i have taught you you get my point 
He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. He now said that, that oh, teach them what I have taught you. Of the things I have shown you. So if there's no intimate knowledge of God, a preacher cannot preach from God. He will preach from books, preach from texts, preach from his head. He cannot preach from God. Until preaching proceed from God. The people that hear you, they will just be ready made sinners in church. They will move from outright sinners to wet sinners in church. Outright sinners to religious sinners. So you will produce an army of born again that are not really transformed on their inside. What's the counsel of God? Before anybody go into ministry, it should have a divine call. There should be a legitimacy. And God say, if, there, if there's no corruption, if there's intimate knowledge, if there's legitimacy, then they will be able to cause the people to hear my word. And as many as hear my word will be torn from their wickedness. But right now, there is no turning because of these things are absent. I have not sent this prophet yet around. At this point, I want to show you the original intent of the five-fold ministry gift. The original intent. The five-fold ministry gifts are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These are not titles. These are functions. So, the fivefold ministry gave was not originally given for us to have assorted titles. And everyone, anyone you want, you pick. No. The original intent of the fivefold ministry gift is not to give us career to pursue, religious career. Or religious profession but today the word pastor has become a religious profession it has become a religious career so you hear they say he is a pastor but he lies he is a pastor but he's a thief he is a pastor oh i was in love with the pastor so we were in relationship so we had one or two children and the pastor now said no i am not marrying you again sorry i'm not going to marry you again we were just cutting he is not a pastor Sad enough, such a person still preaches. Still preaches. Still as a church. So to that person, pastoral, has, so pastoral function has become a religious profession. It's like you being a medical doctor. And it doesn't matter the way you live your life. So long as you are treating the patients. Okay, you also being a so-called pastor. It doesn't matter how you are living your life. So long as you go to church on Sunday and stand on the pulpit and preach anything that enters your head. And you look organized. I want to show you original intent of the fivefold ministry. Are you understanding me? Now, if you look at it, those, those of us going by the title of apostles or prophets or teachers or evangelists, it has just become a profession. There is no lifestyle matching the so-called title. There is no lifestyle of holiness and righteousness matching the title that we are all carrying as apostles, prophets, evangelists, or whatever. I want you to understand the original intent of the fivefold was not to give us a religious profession. Never. Look at the original intent. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. This morning, God has sent me to ask us, which heaven are you going to? Which heaven are you going to? You cannot go to a heaven that our fathers went behaving the way they never did. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. And he himself gave some to be what? Apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. Some of me equipping. Say again, equipping. So the first reason, the first original intent for the fivefold ministry gift is to 
a cube is to do what? A cube is to a cube you and I against sin. That is the first a cupid. To equip us to be able to say no to sin. To be able to live right. To be able to follow the standards of righteousness. Are you understanding me? That is the first kind of equipping that we were, I mean, that, that formed the original intent. The second original intent in that scripture, he said, a define. A define. To a define means to build. It's to build. And if you look at the nurse, it said, till we come to the unity of faith. I don't think there will be time for me to talk about unity of faith. Because, but I will just see what happened. Because we are yet to unite with the faith of our fathers. But watch this. If I say I am a pastor, the original intent of me being a pastor should be if you sit under my ministry at least for even two months you should be able to receive capacity to turn away from sin i should be able to equip you that you are able to overcome the loss of the flesh the pride of life the deceitfulness of riches are you understanding me that also implies if you look at the word edification building constructing i should be able to build you up to construct your faith, you become an edifice for God, where God will live in you. That is the original intent. But if I say I am a pastor, and you come in and I look at how beautiful you are as a lady, and I start cutting you, sending you stupid text messages, let's say I'm even single, not even married, and I start pulling you, I say I want to marry you, and you start coming to my house, I start sleeping with you, and we start living together, and we are still going to marry and after doing that i am not a pastor because i am not equipping you against sin i am defiling you i am not a defying you i am defying you so if you call me a pastor after doing that you are stupid you are very stupid because the word pastor is not a career program it's not a religious profession. It's a tool in the hand of Jesus to equip a lost sinner to make heaven. To equip a sinful person to stand no to sin. To edify the lost. To become a temple for God in the spirit. I cannot even hit the unity of faith. Maybe some other time. The Lord sent me to tell you this. You have to redefine what you call pastor. You have to redefine what you call pastor. In summary, the original intent of the fivefold ministry an apostle, a prophet, a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist our original, I mean, foundational purpose on the face of the earth is to shape whoever God has given us to be equipped to go to heaven and fulfill the call of God upon their lives, to be edified. Not to become temples of demons, but temples of God on the face of the earth. But today, it is different. When you go there, you are, you are more equipped to be wicked. You are equipped to be more crafty and be more deceitful instead of being right. So as a result, the people we call pastors are not pastors. They are weapons of Satan's destruction. Weapon that the devil is using to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Because we have defeated the original intent. Let me tell you something that you may not have considered as a child of God. Why has the devil positioned such ministers of the gospel in the church? Why do we have the sons of Eli? Why do we have pastors? That was supposed to be equipping us to go to heaven. They are not equipping us to go to hell. Why do we have pastors? Instead of edifying us, constructing us to become temple for God in the spirit, we are being constructed to become temples of demons. Why do we have them? Check the church today. There are more possessed people in the church down the street. People have become more possessed, more demonic, more crafty.
more wicked. And yet they use, they hide under the shadow of Christianity and, and still live the wicked life that they are living. And you call that a heaven's candidate? I'm going to show you the possibility in scriptures of a Christian going to hell. I will show you today the possibility. But why has the devil positioned these people? Go to first, uh, second Timothy quickly. Let me show you. Chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 20. Second Timothy. He said, For if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. Do you see the agenda? The letter N is one for another than the beginning. The agenda is that when you come into the church and say you are giving your life, you have given your life to Christ, you are going to meet one so-called apostle, so-called prophet, so-called pastor, so-called evangelist or teacher who would be singing Christian songs, preaching the Bible, but in a in a in a but, but by impact, he is equipping you to go to hell. He is defying you to become a carrier of demons. What, what, what do you think a pastor who sleeps with a church member or who cajole you and say he wants to marry you and after sleeping with you for one or two years, he now drop you. What do you call such a person? What has he done? Watch this. In the night, you sleep with her. In the daytime, you preach to her. What are you doing? In the night you sleep with her. In the daytime you preach to her. What are you doing? You are equipping her for her. You know why? Because it to her she is saved. Even if she's sleeping with you, aborting the children, she is saved. So long as she will need her and shed two drops of tears and fast for three days, God will forgive her. That is stupidity. God is not a fool. It's not a fool, sir. You can catch your people. You cannot catch your God. The Bible says, the foundation of the Lord standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Let he, that name, the name of Christ, depart from iniquity. Not live in iniquity. So what is that pastor doing? He's keeping you for hell because he has told you you are saved and why you are lost. It's more easy for the smoker on the street to repent than you in church. Because you've been a keep for hell. The, the, the Bible says the agenda is to make sure their life become worse than it was. Why? Because you have now become blind. You think you will go there. Why are you not going? Are you understanding me? Look at verse 21 of 2 Peter chapter 2. He said, for it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. Do you see? It? They have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit that is why i call them men of dogs men of pigs are you understanding me you cannot call yourself a bishop call yourself a pastor you have a wife and you are sleeping with another person's wife or sleeping with a young girl who has a bright future you are still telling her she is safe telling yourself you are safe and keeping them for destruction and when maybe you see a fellow person doing what you are doing you can no longer rebuke them rather you are just the scripture to fit your stupid lifestyle and you understand what i'm talking about the bible says you are a dog you are a man of dog, not man of God. No, no, no. The Bible says the dog returns to his own vomit. And the soul, having washed to her wallowing in the mire, salvation will wash you. But if you are posted to, to a dragon's pool and you sit under such terrific so called preachers, you will end up in the very death that you vomited. That is the agenda of the devil. And let me tell you why he's prevailing. Because many people in the church believe that Christians will not go to hell. 
I was preaching in a conference in Nigeria. It was a conference of righteousness. And the first question I asked them, people came from different churches, from winners, from, from a mountain of fire, from Catholic church, from the Assembly of God church, from everywhere. We all assembled. And the first question I asked them, it was a non-dimensional meeting. I asked them, will a Christian go to hell? They said, no. They said, no. And I saw the ignorant in the body of Christ. We all think, if I come out and recite what we call the sinner's prayer, then a pastor calls, certify me born again. I will go there. Let me tell you something. The judge of all is not a pastor. The judge of all is not a prophet. The judge of all is not an apostle. The judge of God is the judge of all is Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The Bible says, For by him were all things created, visible or invisible, and that there be thrones or dominions or principalities. All things were created by him, and for him, he is the one to judge you and I. He will even judge the pastor who satisfied yourself. There are two things that are not transferable. That are not transferable in the execution of the Great Commission. Number one, the ownership of a church is not transferable. You don't call a church a man's church. That's why I rebuke some of you who call Cairo Spirit your church. It's not my church. Ownership is not transferable. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of it shall not prevail against it. No bishop owns a church. No apostle owns a church. No prophet owns a church. We are privileged servants in the kingdom of God. The second thing that is not transferable is the final judgment. Jesus will be the one that will judge everybody. So, if you allow a so-called preacher to satisfy you safe, why by fruit you are lost, you have just deceived yourself. And I used to advise, if anyone deceive you, please don't deceive yourself. If you have been deceived, you can be safe. But if you deceive yourself, come on, nobody can save you. Because the worst sword to fall on is your own sword. When you fall on the sword of the devil, God can set you free. But when you fall on your own sword, even heaven cannot set you free. You have to decide on your own to wake up from it. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? So let me show you the possibility of Christians going to hell. For I, will, I will show you from what the judge of all himself said, Jesus. And what his disciples also said in scripture. Look at Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8 verse 10. Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed him. What did he hear? He heard the confession of the faith of the centurion. Do you understand me? And the Bible says, Jesus said, Assuredly, I said to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I said to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We are in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons, do you see scripture? But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out where? Into utter darkness. Say with me the sons. Say again the sons. What does that mean? Historically, Jesus was telling the Jew, you better accept me now because you are the sons of the kingdom. Because many are going to come from far near and wide. Talking about you and I, the Gentiles. He said, well, they are going to come to accept me and sit in the kingdom. And you Jews that are sons of the kingdom will be casted out in hell. The word outer darkness is a description of hellfire. Are you understanding me? He said you'll be casted out in hell. Now if you look at the same scripture in the immediate present tense, he was telling us, listen, unbelievers who you now see drinking on the street, jumping from one clubhouse to another, who have never gone to church, Jesus said if you are not careful, they will come to accept me and make heaven. But you is a Christian, a son of the kingdom, you have preached. You have led souls to Christ. 
you have called yourself this and call yourself that jesus said be careful you will be casted out in hell if you are not careful the bible said there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth that is the first scripture that i want to show us that tells you and i that christians can, can go to hell a christian who claim to have given his life to Christ can go to hell because your, your life given to Christ makes you a son of the kingdom. But if you don't live the life of the Christ whom you have given yourself to, you'll be cast into hell. Jesus said the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. Let me show you another scripture. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 16 Peter was one of those disciples that sat with him that met him face to face so look at what he wrote to us he says yet if anyone suffers as a Christian do you see it? if anyone suffers as a Christian let him not be ashamed what how do you suffer as a Christian the three Hebrew boys were thrown in the fire because they refused to bow to the God of gold. How do you suffer as a Christian? Because you refuse to sleep with that man. He sucks you. You better go and stay without a job than to go and sleep with that man. Every pain you go through, every joblessness you suffer for same no to sin is a suffering because you're a Christian. Are you understanding me? In the world today, Babylon has been so, I mean, Babylon has, has, has structured the world system in such a way that if you say no to wickedness you pay the price and because of that many christians are afraid to say no to wickedness and peter is telling us if you are suffering because you're a christian if you say no to sin and you don't have a job now if you say no to the wicked one now you don't have a house to live in the bible says that blessed are you do you understand me jesus said blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for they shall receive a blessing in the next life we shall receive a blessing he said for this is the kingdom of heaven we shall receive a blessing are you understanding me don't be too myopic to submit to the sufferings of the moment and miss the glories of eternity look at the next world he said but let him glorify God in this matter. Let's read it one more time. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But let him do what? Glorify God in this matter. That means lift up your hands and give God praise. Each time, the, each time you suffer for being a Christian, maybe you were a liar before and you accepted Jesus and you stopped lying and the money that used to come through your lies stopped coming. Do not call it attack. That is a suffering that you are a Christian. The Bible says lift up your hands and glorify God. Are you understanding me? Maybe you were involved in one all kind of corruption and those things were giving you a house to live, giving you a car to ride and one day life came upon your spirit and he said no more shall I live the way I used to live any suffering you go through they could take the car they could take the house they could take the job the Bible said lift up your hands and rejoice glorify God in this matter Jesus said rejoice because great will be your reward in heaven look at verse 17 for the time has come listen why is Peter saying if you suffer as a Christian let me tell you the truth. We are in a terminal generation. The devil is desperately looking for those that will spend eternity with him. And one thing he, he has done right now, you may not believe me, Satan has attached benefit to iniquity. Do you hear me? Satan has attached benefit to iniquity. That is why many so-called Christians are not living right because the wrong life they are living is making them to have money is making them to have jobs is making them to be comfortable are you understanding me we have christians we have been still and bring to church we have christians who practice harlotry and bring the money to church and since the pastor collects it and bless them they think they are in order the reward of iniquity will always take you to hell do you understand what I'm talking about? So Peter now said, you see this period we are in. The period where the devil has attached reward to iniquity 
and he has attached suffering to righteousness. Satan attached suffering to righteousness. The devil has programmed the world in such a way, any day you genuinely say yes to Jesus, the whole world moves against you. Even people you thought are your fathers, people you thought was a mother, people that love you with the whole of their heart, the moment you genuinely say to Jesus, they start fighting you. Peter said in such a moment that you find yourself. Be very, very careful because the Bible says in verse 7, for the time has come, verse 17, for judgment to begin with at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? You see the Bible. Two things we scoop from here. One, there is suffering in Christianity. Any Christianity you are not paying the price for saying yes to Jesus is insanity. Are you understanding me? Any Christianity you are not paying the price is insanity. And I've come to realize if you are paying the price for, for your Christian faith, no matter how you pray and ask God to take the suffering, he will not. He will tell you, my grace is sufficient for you because you must go through to build some eternal reward for your commitment to jesus there is a crown of righteousness that will be given to those who suffer for his righteousness sake in the door of judgment don't work for your crown and you call it demonic attack are you understanding me the second thing we can get from this scripture is the possibility of Christians going to hell. Because he said judgment will begin from where? The house of God. Watch this. If it's not possible for Christians to go to hell, why would God begin judgment in the house of God? Why, why wouldn't God begin judgment on the street? Talk to me. Why didn't the Bible say, Judge, it, is, it is now time for judgment to begin in the clubhouse? Is that what's in the Bible? Did he say it's not time for judgment to begin in harlot houses? Did he say it's not time for judgment to begin among politicians? He said in the house. Why should judgment begin in the house? A place where we all think everybody that assembled is safe. Why would judgment begin among the safe? It's because some are not saved. It's because of the possibility of those who claim safe not to go to heaven. Look at verse 18. He said, now if the righteous are scarcely saved. Do you see scripture? If the righteous, righteous are scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? If the righteous are scarcely saved, that is why our fathers, they got these things right. You hear people like Paul writing, he said, we work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it's very possible that you say yes to Jesus today and when you close your eyes in death, tomorrow you end up in hell. It's very possible for a, a Christian to go to hell. Very, very possible. Let me show you a parable that explains it more clearly. Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. Look at what the, the Bible says. Verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables. And said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Remember the marriage supper I spoke about when we had the school of Bible prophecy. Are you understanding me? He said, arrange a marriage for his son and set out his servant to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. These are the evangelists sent to invite sinners to go. But for, again, he sent the other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen, and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready, come to the wedding, but they made light of it, and went their own ways. You see what the devil did to these people? You don't make light of supernatural invitations. Uh, your brother could invite you to a wedding, and you turn, you turn it down. Do not turn Jesus down when he invited you to his own wedding. Because when you turn it down, you have sown a seed for eternal damnation. Each time you are invited to a conference where you'll be taught righteousness and you turn it down, you have sown a seed to your destruction. 
It's time you are invited to come and hear the word of truth and righteousness. And you give excuses. You have just sown a seed to destroy your soul in hell. God's invitations should not be turned down. A generation that turned God's invitation down, they have opened their lives to eternal damnation. Are you understanding me? But this parable, first of all, referred to the nation of Israel. How God used the prophets to invite them to the kingdom and they refused to listen. The Bible says in the next statement, one of, he said, he said one, he said, he said verse five, but they made light of it and went their ways. One to his own farm, another to his own business. And the rest, says in servant, treated them spitefully and killed them. You see how the Israelites killed the prophets. Even Jesus himself was killed. Are you understanding me? But look at today. It is still repeating itself. The so-called Christians, you invite them to a meeting that will prepare them for heaven. They make light of it. They give you excuses. I, am, I have a funeral to attend. I have a wedding to attend. I have a, 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 a graduation ceremony to attend. I have a business contact. Can you imagine somebody come to church and a business contact calls you out in church? What even those we call lost sinners cannot do? There is no idol worshiper that go to a shrine and his phone rings. No. No. No idol worshiper goes to a shrine and his phone is off. Have you ever seen, even in the movies, an idol worshiper went to a shrine, even those of you who, are, who were going before, and while the weird doctor is talking to you, your phone is ringing? But people come to church and their phone rings. They go out to pick why heaven and earth is talking. Why the God of heaven and earth is talking to them. People respect the devil. They don't respect God. And you say you are going to heaven. Ask your neighbor, which heaven are you going to? Which one? Do you understand me? Which one are you going to? So, so even those who serve Satan, they take him serious. And you will serve God. You play with him. You make it a light thing. And you say you are going to heaven. Which one? Which one are you going to? You come to church, you can't sit down to hear the word. You are jumping. Where, where, which heaven are you going to? Which one? The Bible said they make it a light thing. When you make preaching of righteousness a light thing, you're not going to go to this heaven we're talking about. Are you understanding me? When you turn down God's invitations and give legitimate excuses for turning down God's invitation, you are not going to the heaven that Paul went to, that Jesus is king. You can't go there. Stop the insanity you call Christianity. It's not Christianity. You are heading to hell. The heart of Jesus is weeping this morning. For that soul will strap on the broad way that leads to damnation. Are you understanding me? Embracing what you call Christianity. Why it is insanity. Are you understanding me? The Bible said they made a light in. Look at verse 6. It said, and the rest, since his servant, treated them spitefully and killed them. They treat those who bring the genuine word spitefully. You call them names. You don't even have value for them. You don't go to a sorcerer and walk out while he's talking to you. You don't go to a witch doctor while he's playing the oracle. Playing the oracle. You now say, I am coming. And you walk out. The demon will pursue you and beat you up. Nobody even does that. Then why do you do it to Jesus? And you, and you think when you close your eyes in death, he, you, will go to, you will go and live with him. He will carry your soul. It's a lie. You have rejected him already. People come to church, they're on Facebook, they're on YouTube. In church. And you want to go, go to heaven. Which one? Which heaven are you going to? Look at what the Bible says. Verse 8. Verse 7. He said, but when the king had heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his army, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their cities. If you look at this scripture in the history of Israel, about seven empires rose up that destroyed Israel. Seven empires. It's because of divine judgment. Nebuchadnezzar came, burned the city at one time because they refused to accept the word of the Lord. That nation have suffered in the hand of the Lord because they refused to accept the word of the Lord. God used them as an example to show us anytime we reject his word, we suffer in the hand of the enemy. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? So the Bible went on to say, therefore, verse 8, then he said to his servant, the wedding is ready, but those who are invited were not worthy. May you be worthy. I said, may you be worthy. 
in the name of Jesus. Because it's one thing to be invited, another to accept the invitation, and another to be found worthy. Do you understand me? He said, therefore, go into the highways as, an, as many as you find, invite to their wedding. This is historically, he's talking about us, the Gentiles. How God invited us to Jesus because the Jews, first of all, rejected him. Look at verse 10. So those servants went into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Our churches today are filled with the people. In Nigeria, every Sunday, in some of the states in my country, every Sunday, the streets are dry, the markets are dry. We are all gathered in the house of God. Do you understand me? Many assemble. The hall is filled today. In some places you go, churches are everywhere. The halls are filled. But look at what the Bible says in verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guest, Jesus has entered the church right now. He's checking those of us who call ourselves Christians. He's looking at us. Yes, you have accepted me. Yes, you have recited the sinner's prayer. And you are seated in your position in the spirit realm. He's going about checking. The things he's checking and the things that are breaking his heart are the things he's reporting to some of us to cry on the face of the earth. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? And the Bible says he went checking. He went checking. Look at verse 11. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on what? A wedding garment. But he was inside. It's possible to go to hell as a Christian. He was inside. He was already a Christian. He was already born again, quote and unquote. And he was seated in the church and the owner of the church the, was going about checking. The pastor have already certified him. Maybe he has become a preacher. Maybe he has become an apostle or a prophet. But Jesus was going about checking. He now stopped. I said, hey, you, you don't have wedding garment. It's not about the beauty. That, it's not about the clothes you are wearing. It's about who you are wearing. I, you see, there are four questions that every child of God must ask himself. I will end this world with those questions the Lord gave me. That we must ask ourselves every day. Listen carefully. Jesus is going about checking which garment are you wearing? Are you wearing a wedding garment? What's a wedding garment? It's a lifestyle of deep intimacy with Jesus. That is a wedding garment. A lifestyle of covenant work with Jesus. A, the covenant of grace. The covenant of worship. The covenant of salt, which is not drinking salt like the sorcerer or using salt to pray. No, no, no. The four basic covenant that I wrote in that book, writing on covenant ways, that is a wedding garment. God will check, are you wearing the garment are you in covenant relationship with me are you in a deep intimacy with me do you operate the covenant of fresh friendship do you operate the covenant of grace do you operate do you, do you walk in these things do you implement the covenant of peace these are the things that he's checking he's going about checking in the church sad enough in this parable it was only one person that was not wearing a wedding garment but today we have majority not wearing a wedding garment very few are we are in it. If God should open your eyes to see the state of the church, you will weep. Look at what the Bible says. He who is not wearing the wedding garment in this parable represents that Christian that will go to hell. That Christian, he may travel around the world doing evangelism, giving all the money he can give in the church, but if he's not wearing a wedding garment, hell will be his destination look at what the bible says in the in verse 12 so he said to him friend did he say enemy he said friend how do you come in here how how without the wedding garment and the guy was speechless may god ask, ask us this question here on earth because if he asks you after you have died that is the end of you A preacher told us how he died and he was being taken to hell by God. Jesus took him to heaven and showed him all the things he promised him. And said, but because he did not live right, he, 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 he threw him to hell. When the man screamed, Jesus said, okay, I will give you a last chance. Go back to the world and tell them, warn my church. You don't go to heaven by reciting the sinner's prayer. Are you understanding me? That is what the Americans taught you. 
Look at them. They are, they, are, they are all gays and they are all lesbians. And they still say they are going to heaven. Which heaven is a gay going? Which heaven is a lesbian going? After the Lord sent me to ask you, which heaven are you going to? You say you are going to heaven as a Christian. Which one? Which one are you going to? Is it a heaven without a wedding garment? In heaven, we go there with wedding garment. Where is your own? How do you come in? How do you sneak into the church and you become an apostle and yet there's no wedding garment? How do you sneak in? You become a pastor and yet there's no wedding garment. How do you sneak in? You become a deacon. You become a church worker and there's no wedding garment. How? May God ask us that question here in time. You need to go home and search yourself if you are wearing the wedding garment. Because if he asks you when you have closed your eyes in death, that is the end of you. Look at what the Bible says. In verse 13, and the king said to the servant, bind him. Hand on foot. Do you see? Take him away and cast him away into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why? For many are called. All of us are called. But few are chosen. Tell your, tell your neighbor it is possible for Christians to go to hell. Tell the next person it is possible for Christians to go to hell. You see, your voice is low. I understand perfectly. If I have said, tell them that they will marry this year, you are going to shout. If I have said, tell them that God will give them one million, you are going to shout. But it is very understandable that you are now quiet and you can't talk again. Your voice has disappeared. Come on, shout to the ear of your neighbor. It is possible for you to go to hell. What a church. These are the things we should be thinking about. It's very possible. He's going about today in every church. Jesus, checking the garments, checking everything, and reporting to the prophetic ears. He's raising genuine apostles by content, a prophets by content, to cry his word to the church and say, Wake up and put on your garments because it is departure time. It's departure time. We are praying against death, but I'm very sorry. There's no prayer against death that will cancel death. We we'll all die. If Jesus tarries, all of us will all die. Are you not saying? <laughs> Let me take you further. Look at what Paul said. First Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 1. Very possible that Christian can go to hell. First Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 1. It's very possible that a preacher, an apostle, a prophet, very possible. They have been done all. They can still go to hell. Look at what he said. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. But they drank of that rock, spiritual rock, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, do you see it? With most of them, God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. One way God tells you in time that you may not make heaven when you die as a Christian is when the demons are invading you and you call yourself Christians. When demons are invading you left, right, and center and you call yourself a Christian, that is a sign that when you die, you are not making heaven. David said, this is how I know that God is well pleasing. This is how I know that my life pleases God when my enemy fall before me. If a man's way please the Lord, how do we know even his enemies will be made to be what at peace? If a man will please the Lord, the, his enemies cannot prevail over him. The Bible said their bodies were scattered because God was not pleasing. Look at the way things are scattering in the church today. Marriage is scattering, health is scattering, everything is scattering, and we think we are going to heaven. Which heaven? Ask your neighbor which heaven. Look at what the Bible says. He said, now these things became our example. To the intent that we should not lost after evil things as they all lost it. So if a Christian is lustful, hell will be his home if he dies without repenting. Do you understand me? Oh God. He now said, and do not become idolaters. As were some of them, as it's written, the people sat down to eat and drank and rose up to play. Now let us commit sexual immorality. As some of them did, and in one day, 23,000 fell. 
nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by the serpent nor murmur as some of them also murmured and were destroyed by the destroyer now all these things happened to them as example and they were written for what our admonition on whom the ends of the ages have come verse 12 therefore let him who thinks he stands take least he is just what for you see that is the deception spiritual arrogance religious arrogance i am safe and spirit filled i am this and that demonic arrogance that has blindfold people the bible says the christian race anytime you start thinking that you are standing that's a sign that you are falling in this race there's no arrogance it's a race of soberness are you understanding me i read those scriptures to show you the possibility of a christian going to hell now let me show you the biblical description of people who will never make the heaven that our fathers went to when i say the heaven our fathers went to i'm not referring to the people you call fathers in the church i'm talking about the apostles i'm talking about abraham do you, do you get my point? I'm talking about Enoch who walked with God and it was not for God took him. I'm talking about Seth who gave back to a child that as soon as his child was born, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. I'm talking about Noah who built an ark to save the whole world. Yes, after the flood, he allowed the flood of sin to enter him. But Noah did not die that way. He repented. Are you understanding me? I'm talking about the heaven that our fathers went. The very heaven that when Jesus came out of the grave, he let captivity captive all the righteous dead he rescued he picked all of them and went to heaven the very heaven that jesus look at the thief on the cross who repented and said today you will be with me in paradise that is the heaven i'm talking about let me show you people that will never get there every christian write it down every christian in the pool of the dragon can never get there every christian in the pool of the dragon every christian in the dragon pool will never get there do you understand me now let's see the description of the characters of christians in the dragon pool psalm 59 i'm talking to believers because my primary assignment is to the church my primary assignment is to the body of christ psalm 5 let's see what the bible says Psalm 5, verse 9. Look at the character description of people that will never make the heaven that our fathers went. Psalm 5, verse 9. He said, For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Do you see it? That means they are all reliable. The person talks big, but you can't trust what he's saying. Do we have Christians like that? Do we have pastors like that? Then which heaven are they going to? sadly when they die you say they have gone to be with the lord which lord jesus is called the way the truth and the life if you are called the liar the liar the liar you can't go and be with him when you die do you understand me he said for there is no faithfulness in their mouth their inward part is destruction their throat is an open tomb they flatter with their tongue look at what david said pronounce them guilty oh god do you see pronounce them guilty look at another scripture that gave us a description of those that you would, would never go to the heaven that Jesus went. The heaven that Jesus is preparing for us. They will never get there. If we live the way this scripture is saying, we will never get there. Are you understanding me? Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. He said, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devised wicked plans. Feet that are swift in running to evil. Do you see? People who do this thing, they will never go to heaven. You may be a pope. You may be a preacher. You may be anything. You can't go to heaven doing this nonsense. He now say a false witness who speak lies and the one who sows discord among brethren. When you go home, use Amplify to read this scripture. It will open your eyes to more insight. Because if you live 
a lifestyle that God called abomination, don't think that when you close your eyes in death, angels will carry you. No. Demons will take you through a portal of hell into hell. Angels don't carry people like this. Look at the next scripture. Second Timothy chapter 3. So many scriptures. I'm opening just few because of time constraint. Second Timothy chapter 3. Quickly. Jesus now more than ever we are sailing a stormy weather all God's children should get together for we need Jesus now more than ever look at second Timothy chapter 3 verse 1 he said but know this that in the last days perilous times will come why because of perilous people perilous people in the church verse 2 for men will be what lovers of themselves do you see it in the character description of people that will never go to the heaven that jesus has gone R remember jesus said in john 14 i go to prepare a place for you you will never go there he said lovers of themselves Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. So you are, you are a Christian, you don't forgive. You now say you will go to heaven. Which one? Ask your neighbor, which heaven are you going to? You don't forgive. And, and while you talk what they did to you, you are crying. I will never forgive. I will never forgive. Die and see what's going to happen. He now said, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying his power. Look at the advice. And from such people, turn away. Because they are on the broad way that leads to destruction. So if you walk with them, you will end whatever they will end. Do you understand me? These are the kind of people that will never go to the heaven that Jesus is talking about. They will never get there. The Bible will not say, of this sort are those who creep into a household and make captives of gullible women. Hmm. Do you know that for a woman to believe a pastor who is married somewhere and he claims he's not married. You get my point? For a woman to believe such a pastor and say, I want to marry you, and she moves into his house and they start sleeping together, the woman is gullible. She is, do you know what it means to be gullible? To be willing to believe anything that will meet your need. Anything. The Bible says, this kind of people who call themselves Christians, but they have this character fruit. They will take captives of gullible women. Even smart, what they call smart young men in church. They, they, it's like, you know, there are certain fishes you want to go and buy. I don't know why you have it there in Kenya, in Nigeria. If you want to go and buy live fishes, what we call the catfish. So the catfish will be going like this in this little pond. And they will ask you to point anyone you want. They call point and kill. So as you point it, they kill it and take it straight to the kitchen. Cook it right there and you eat so some young men come study the women who have cars who have good job point of point and kill you get my point as as you check check this don't have a car this don't have that this don't have a house you now meet her i want to marry you i want to marry you it's not like this and because she's also gullible she smile stupid smile hmm. And one, two, three, he moves to your house. Stupid woman. Is he a man that should move to your house or you move to his house? Who is the husband? And when were you supposed to move? Were you not supposed to move after you have followed the seven steps into a marriage? And the pastor has sanctified your husband and wife and put a blessing on you before you move? But Zumbi will not allow that to happen. Because you are gullible. 
Look at what the Bible says. They take captives of godly women. Loaded down with sin. They can easily jump on the sex drive. On anyone loaded with sin. The Bible says they are led away by various lust. Look at verse 17. Always learning. Verse 7. Always learning. And never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So somebody who is always learning. And never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Cannot go to the heaven Jesus has gone to prepare. Somebody come to a place like this where there is a world of truth and righteousness. And yet you don't understand what we are saying. You, you are not going to the heaven. Because the world that is being preached is from the heaven we are all, all going to. So if you don't understand the language of your destination, it's a sign that you are not going there. Do you understand me? In Nigeria, remember, unbelievers who even understand me better than so-called Christians. I will preach and the pastors will say, this is too high, simplify it. But an unbeliever on the street will read the same thing and begin to weep. Looking for me to give his life to Christ. You will call yourself child, child of God. You don't understand the language of the God whose child you are. You are illegitimate. You are not his child. Do you understand me? Naturally, no, no child will not understand the voice of his father. Are you understanding me? He said, always learning. They are not coming to the knowledge of the truth. Look at verse 8. Now as James and Jim Bresses resisted Moses, so do this also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, these are proof concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their fool will be manifest for, to all, as theirs also was. You see, this is a description of people that will never go to the heaven that Jesus went to prepare. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. He said, I judge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. We will judge the living and the dead as his appearing and his kingdom. Look at verse 12. Verse 2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Why? For the time will come, which we are now, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves was teachers. This is a description of an, another type of Christians that will never go to the heaven that Jesus has gone to prepare. If you cannot endure sound doctrine, if you turn your ears from the truth, you want to hear the voice crying against you from your village. You want to hear the evil foundation, the gospel of evil foundation. You want to hear the gospel of firstborn. You are suffering because you are firstborn. You want to hear the gospel of going to a put evil altar, but you don't want to hear the gospel that tells you the altar is your heart. You have to change your, the way you live. You have to repent of your wicked ways. Are you understanding me? You, want to, you don't want to hear the gospel that tells you live right, be righteous. You want to hear the gospel that says live anyhow and God will bless you whether you like it or not. The Bible says in verse 4, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, tell your neighbor, say, but you, be watchful in all things. I didn't hear you. Look at the next word. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. And let me add this without doing damage to the scripture. Fulfill your calling as a child of God. Fulfill your calling as a child of God. How is your calling fulfilled? It is when you close your eyes and you wake up in the arms of Jesus. And he tells you, welcome that good and faithful servant. That is when your calling has been fulfilled. Until that happens, you must keep running this race. And not looking at the face of the devil. And not responding to the flesh or the things of the devil. You must keep running this race. We will not stop. You must keep running. This is a description of people that will never make it. Look at Galatians chapter 5. How it describes people that will never go to the heaven that Jesus has gone to prepare. Galatians chapter 5 verse 19. He said, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are what? Adultery. I hope there will be time. To, I want to pick some things that we are, people are trapped in. Some things that people are trapped in. What did he say? Adultery. I'll just pick some things here and talk about them. He said, 
which are adultery, fornication. Number two, fornication. What the world call fun. They have, they have changed it to fun. The Bible calls it fornication. He now said uncleanness, licentiousness. Uncleanness, I told you, if you are uh, smoking and you think you are going to heaven, sorry, I'm so sorry, you can't go. Do you, do you understand me? It's not this heaven that Jesus went to prepare that you will go with sticks of cigarette in your mouth. Mm -mm. It's not that one. Because there is no angel that is smoking there. Are you, are you understanding me? The only thing they smoke there is God's glory. That is what they, they breathe it in and they breathe it out. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? So the Bible now says licentiousness, which is part of sexual immorality, making use of the grace of God to live in sexual sin. Idolatry, having, I mean, placing things in your life higher than God. You place your job higher than God. You place the, the, the grave for comfort higher than God. You place your parents higher than God. Anything you place higher than God makes you an idolater. And he heaven is, is not the home of idolaters. Sorcery. Look at the next statement. Hatred. Tell me hatred. Contentions. Jealousies. Adverse of wrath. Selfish ambitions. That's another thing I want to touch. Selfish ambitions. Are you understanding me? Now he now went on to say to say dissensions, heresies. That's another thing I want to touch. Heresies. Do you see people who have this character? Look at what the Bible says. It says envy, murders, drunkenness. Show me drunkenness. There's no space for me to write that. There are preachers who believe that if you drink, take alcohol, you will not go to hell. You will go to heaven. Some of them take it before preaching. They or take it after. You get my point? There are churches who believe taking alcohol is not a problem. You can just drink it. Nothing will happen. Jesus turned water to wine and they don't go and check which of the wines. Do you understand me? God will not be against alcohol and turn water into alcohol. Man may do that but not God. Are you understanding me? The book of Proverbs made it very clear that give wine to he that want to perish. So if you want to go to hell, go and take the bottles. Drunkenness. You cannot be, you see, you cannot be taking alcohol and go to a heaven that people that are there are not taking alcohol. In answer, rivalries, parties, and social functions that does not glorify God. You get my point? Every funeral you are there, every bad day you are there, even no matter what, whoever is celebrating, whatever you are there, don't know that when the wicked celebrate their bad day, heavens rumbles. May God help us. He said, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not do what? Will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I want to define the word adultery and fornication and selfish ambition and heresy. Now, let me begin with heresies. Heresies is half truth or outright lies. Half truth or outright lies. When a preacher is preaching half truth or outright lies, when he dies, he's not going to heaven. Do you understand me? When a Christian believes in half truth or outright lies, when you die, you're not going to heaven. So in the light of this, everybody who imbibe the gospel of the kind of deliverance we have today, all the lies they preach on the pulpit, that you are suffering because you're firstborn, that you must give the first salary of the year for God to bless you. And all these kind of lies, money making lies that they tell is part of heresies. Are you understanding me? Nobody, in fact, the most dangerous heresy is the heresy about grace. The sin you, you are committing yesterday, God has forgiven you. The one you will commit, He will also forgive you. And they kill your sense of divine conviction. So heresies and people trapped in it cannot make heaven. Selfish ambition. If you are not pushing the will of God on earth. If you are doing your own will. If you are using God to validate your will. Or 
you the bible says you are selfish are you understanding me so if you are trapped in selfish ambitions you're going you're not going to the heaven that jesus has got to prepare if you are involved in fornication what is fornication is sexual relationship between two unmarried people or between or let me say when an unmarried person gets involved in sexual relationship that person is a fornicator she may be sleeping with a married man or someone who is not married or a married woman or someone who is not married you are a fornicator are you understanding me and there's no fornicator that will make heaven or you are living with a man you are not sleeping with so many you are just sleeping with one you are with him in the same house you people are not married you are just cohabitation cohabitating you may not like what i'm saying this morning the bible calls you a fornicator are you understanding me because you are just cohabitating you are not married you could be bearing children the bible calls them children of fornication i want to tell you the truth you may not like what i'm saying you may not believe in it if you close your eye in death heaven will not be your home that is why in this church we teach those who are cohabitating to go and marry properly pay bright price come to church let's bless your marriage get things done properly because hell is hot do you understand me hell is hot you are fornicating then what is adultery if you read from the amplified version the very scripture in luke chapter 16 verse 18 look at how god defined adultery how jesus the judge of all define adultery Luke chapter 16 we all know it is sexual relationship between a married person and a married person or a married person and a single person any married person involved in sexual relationship outside his marital vows that person is an adulterer if he closes his eye in death he's not going to make heaven he could be a bishop he could be a pastor he could be an apostle wherever he is that is what the bible says it's not what me i'm saying luke 16 are we all there verse 18 look at what it says it says whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery and whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery galatians chapter 6 now says what chapter 5 now says what the adulterer will not make heaven so what is the meaning of whoever divorces his wife let's define who is a wife he did not say whoever divorced a woman do you understand me he did not say whoever divorced a woman because if you are not married if, if you are cohabitating whoever you are living with is not a wife he's just a woman so the word divorce does not come in because the word divorce is used for people who are legally legitimately and properly married are you understanding me you are legally you are legitimately you are properly married and every christian understands the word proper marriage do you understand me so the bible is saying if you are legitimately and properly married to, to someone you are not expected to improperly divorce the person and what was the meaning of divorce amplified gave us two descriptions number one he said dismiss so me dismiss now when you cannot just wake up you are married to this woman or this man properly proper marriage you get my point not improper i'm not talking about cohabitating I'm not talking about just crossing and living together. I'm talking about properly married. We know proper marriage. There have to be the will of God in it. There have to be a wedding. There have to be pain or bright pride. There have to be everything ordained of God. That is proper marriage. Now you cannot wake up one morning and dismiss either the man or the woman and jump to another person the bible says you are an adulterer when you close your eyes in death you cannot make he heaven so amplified God is dismiss so me dismiss jesus said in matthew 19 that nobody is expected to put away his wife as or a woman is expected to put away her husband except for adultery except for sexual sin or any form of treachery you get my point there are biblical boundaries for dealing with those issues in marriages so jesus said if there's no grievous 
thing that has happened then you are not expected to dismiss so if you dismiss your spouse you may be living in the same house properly married but you are dismissed this one is sleeping in room a the other one is sleeping in room b if two of you die you are going to hell that's what the bible says i was told of a couple properly married blessed with their children but they have dismissed themselves in the marriage out of just conflict little conflict in the house not that anybody has committed adultery or anybody has brought any woman or man to the house they're just disagreement so this one now say living into that room do not want to live into that room each time this one travel this one will be praying that the person dies so i marry another person if this one travel this one will be praying and i told the person who told me if i were their pastors i will kill everything because you guys are not murderers so Kuku dismiss go home and leave stay single till you die do you understand my point you see they have wrongly dismissed themselves and the funny thing is that there were elders in the church the wife was a deaconess the husband was a deacon so anytime he stands on the altar to give announcements or do his deacon duty the woman will be cursing him in, in her heart and anytime the woman also stand on the altar he will be cursing her in the heart those people are no longer christians they are hell candidates that have been prepared for hell in the church. Are you understanding me? Look at the net word I got from the Amplified. What does it mean? Write the word repudiate. Repudiate. R E P U D I A T E. Repudiate. We are looking at a biblical description. <coughs> People that will not make heaven if they close their eyes in death. Are you understanding me? The biblical description. So me repudiate. What does it mean to repudiate? Write this on number one. To refuse to accept. So, if you are properly and legally married to someone and you now refuse to accept the person after a while of marriage, based on disagreement that are not grievous like i said we know things that the bible is talking about so disagreements that are not grievous things that are just minor you see you see there are men that <coughs> just re refuse to accept their wives <coughs> because maybe to them she's no longer beautiful but she was beautiful the day you wedded she was beautiful when you went to pay the bride price. You get my point? But now she's no longer. And you start at bring, bring her something, spending time with other women, spending time with other women and sleeping with them and coming back. You are on your path to hell. That's what the Bible says. It now says reject. To, it means to reject. It also means to renounce. Do you understand me? It means to give up, to turn one's back on. To have nothing more to do with or deny the truth of validity of. There was somebody I met one time. He told me, <clears throat> let me check my wife if she's sleeping with her boss. I said, how? He said, you're a prophet. I'm going to bring her. Look at her. I said, no, I'm not a sorcerer. You get my point? And the next thing was, why are you having these misgivings oh he gave me his reasons and i asked him do you marry properly say yes we did that we cut it with this and this and our pastor and i know the pastor one of the big guys in our nation where that was and i said now what's the problem he started denying the validity of the process they went through whenever a man or a woman want to do wickedness they will deny the truth do you understand me they will deny the truth jesus is saying if you are properly married it's not cohabitation if you are properly married he leaves you and he gives you a husband or he gives you a wife and you one day get up reject the person renounce the person give up on the person turn your back have nothing more to do with the person or deny the truth that jesus gave you the person he said when you close your eyes in death you are not going to heaven that's what the bible says are you understanding me am i still your friend this morning now let me show you somebody may sit down there and say this pastor is condemning us 
He's judging us. I want to show you Bible warning to such intelligent fools. You get my point? I'm not the one that called them intelligent fools. It's the Bible that called them intelligent fools. Paul said, oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Are you understanding what I'm talking about? I want you to get this straight. It is, I've heard people quote Second Corinthians chapter 3 verse 9 and they describe teachings like what you're hearing this morning. Warnings like what you're hearing this morning. They describe them as condemning people. Ministry of condemnation. But let's look at what is the real ministry of condemnation? What is the judgment of God on these intelligent fools? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. God wants to set our lives straight because he wants to have all of us in heaven. Are you understanding me? The greatest accomplishment in the life of a human being is when you die and you end in the hands of Jesus. That's the greatest accomplishment. Paul said, he said, he said, there is no layoff for me. He said, I have run the race. I have finished my course. Now there's layoff for me, the crown. Do you understand me? So that is the greatest accomplishment. It's not when you have a PhD. It's when you end in the hands of Jesus. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? So 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 7. The Bible says, but if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance which glory was passing away what it, does the Bible mean? everything in the Old Testament the law of Moses and what Moses did the Bible called it the ministry of death and yet it has the glory of God in it why did he call it the ministry of death? he was simply saying they could warn about hell, if I may use that word. Or they could warn about sin. And they could warn about living a righteous life. Or encourage people to live a righteous life. He said, but they have no power to impart them. You get my point? There was no power. Moses could stand and say, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. But there's no anointing to transform the stiff. And stop him from stealing. Do you understand me? So as a result, it was a ministry of death. It was not transmitting life into people. That is why it's called the ministry of death. That is why you see God saying, I will make a new covenant with them. I will put my spirit in them. And I will write my law in their hearts. That becomes a ministry of life. Are you understanding me? So in another world, what is the ministry of death today? Any preaching... That is not impacting you with the life of God. To live holy is a means of death. Do you understand me? Is, are there churches on ground today that when you sit down or you attend the service, you, you will not even know what is holiness? Talk to me. Do we have them on ground? Are there ministers that when they finish preaching, the, 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 the power to, stay, to say no no to sin cannot be imparted to you. That is a ministry of death. So a, the ministry of death is not a, a minister that tells you live right. When you do this you go to hell. When you do that you go to heaven. That is a ministry of righteousness. It's a ministry of life. If it's imparting you with a strength to say no to sin. But any church or minister who is not imparting you with the energy to say no to sin that is a ministry of death. I remember one lady sent me a message she worships in the church. Oh, she, I ask her, how was how is it? Because of her message. Oh, it's very powerful. Our bishop preaches very well. But the problem I'm having, I have had issues with sexual passions all my years I've been worshiping there. And, and when I heard you, and I said, let me call you for help. And I said, why didn't you call your bishop for help? I have my own people I'm taking care of. Why is it that you, you, you say the place is powerful? The place, they preach very well. And yet, their preaching have not saved you from sexual sins. That is a ministry of death. Do you understand me? That is a ministry of death. To make the matters worse, the bishop that he tells me preach powerfully, want to sleep with her. You see the way Christians deceive themselves. And yet she say he preaches well. So what is the preaching? So the impact of the word 
is what is what the Bible is talking about. It said, "By their fruit we shall know them." So, if the word that is being preached is not stirring up righteousness and giving the strength to say no to sin, that is the ministry of death. Do you understand me? Look at what the Bible says. It says, "How would the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious?" So, any ministry that imparts you to live right is the ministry of the Spirit. Do you understand me? Verse 9 said, For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exists more in glory. What is the ministry of condemnation? Is that ministry of the Old Testament? That, is not in, that was not injecting life in the people. It could not transform a liar. It could not transform a thief. That is a ministry of condemnation. So the ministry of condemnation is not looking at a thief and calling him a thief. He's not looking at an adulterer and calling the person you are an adulterer. He's not looking at a gay and say, hey, you are a gay. You will go to hell if you die in gay. You better repent. You see, it is the f- intelligent fools that cause such condemnation. You are not condemning because they are already condemned. You are opening their eyes to see where they will go if they die. Do you understand me? So when somebody say, don't condemn, tell the person you are condemned already. So I'm not condemned. Condemn you. I'm opening your eyes to see where you would where, where you would drop if you close your eyes in death. How many of you are understanding me here this morning? So the Bible now went on to say that for even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because the glory that excelled for if what was passing away was glorious what remains is more glorious therefore since we have such hope we use great boldness of speech unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away but their minds were hardened for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the Old Testament because the veil is taken away we are in Christ so the ministry of righteousness takes away veils it breaks a hardened heart some of you were have hardened heart you were hard in sin you were hard you sold yourself to sin but when you step into this ministry God begin to break your heart and break that hardness of heart and today you have renounced the hidden works of shame because you are now under the ministry of righteousness are you understanding what I'm talking about so the ministry of condemnation is not a ministry that call a spade a spade are you understanding me it's a ministry that does not transmit the life of God in people it condemns them can I go deeper on that statement when a preacher who is preaching uh, Jesus sleeps with a woman and seal her damnation he has condemned her to eternal damnation do you know many people are not in church because of what pastors did with them I'm not talking about the wicked who lie against preachers I'm talking about people who were abused and dropped. You got my point? The person slept with you. He says, get to marry you. I collected your money. You gave your car. You gave your land. You gave everything. And one day, after he has soaked all the juice because you were stupid. Can, can you imagine? A woman gave her money, gave her car, gave everything, gave her sexuality. Stupid. Why can't you give the car and leave your sexuality? And leave your body intact? But you gave everything including the body. So the man soak everything, soak the money, soak the body, and not drop you and go. Such a woman, you will need encounter with Jesus to still believe that they are righteous men of God. Do you understand me? So, so the life of that person has been sealed. That is a ministry of condemnation. In fact, it's actually a ministry of hypocrisy. Let's go forward. I want to show you three things then we close number one the ultimate condition for making heaven was the ultimate condition for making heaven it's not just joining a church it's not just reciting the sinner's prayer look at Colossians chapter 1 Colossians chapter 1 hallelujah to Jesus we must all go home and go and sit down and reflect on the word of the Lord this moment. Are you understanding me? Colossians 1 verse 26. It said the mystery which have been hidden from ages 
and from generations may now have been revealed to his saints. Hallelujah. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which was the mystery? Which is Christ in you. The hope of what? Glory. Christ in you. So the ultimate condition for making heaven is not a recitation of sinner's prayer. It's Christ in you. It's Christ in you. That is the ultimate con condition for making heaven. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Look at how First John chapter 5 further explained it to us. First John chapter 5 verse 11. Look at what it says. First John chapter 5 verse 11. It says, and this is the testimony that God has given us what? Eternal life. And this life is where? In his son. He who has the son has what? Has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. Because I've heard Christians who quote this scripture and they impute it upon themselves that since they are in church, they have life. But if you look at the lifestyles, you don't see the life. Do you understand me? He said, He who has a son has life. That means you will see a new life. If Christ is in you, it shows in the lifestyle. That's what the Bible is saying here. If you're a liar, you no longer lie. If you're a thief, no longer thief. If you're a fornicator, you no longer fornicate. If you were involved in anything, as soon as he enters, you leave it. He who has the son has life. Now, in I say, he who does not have the son, how do you know? He does not have life. So when, so when Christ is in you, it shows in your character. But if you claim that Christ is in you, your, and, and your character is not showing us, that, is a, that means it's not in you. So the ultimate condition for making heaven is what? Christ in you. The Bible says if anyone be in Christ, is a new creature. Now, we first of all come into Christ. As we come into Christ, he enters us and creates a new life within us. So when that new life is created within you, you begin to live a heavenly life on earth. The ultimate condition for making the heaven is Christ in you. If he has entered you, it will show in your character. Number two, I want, to, I want to give you what I call the big questions to ask ourselves. The big question to ask ourselves. Who is living in me? Can you ask yourself that question? Tell me who is living in me? Ask, add more strength to that. Add more strength to that. Because if the ultimate condition for going to heaven is Christ living in me, so it's very important that I always ask myself, maybe on daily basis, who is living in me? Because Christ in me, the hope of glory. Who is not living in me? Now, there are four other questions that will help you understand this question. Number one, write this down. Whoever lives in you will be the one driving you. Whoever lives in you will be the one what? Driving you in life. Whoever lives in you will be the one driving you. Let me tell you something. In the church today, we take pride in our cars that we drive. We take pride in the things we drive. But the most important thing is not what you are driving. It is who is driving you. That's the most important thing in this life. It's, it's not the kind of car you drive. No, it's the kind of spirit driving you. You may drive the best car on earth, but what is driving you is an unclean spirit. And I want to show you the signs that you can use to check yourself when what is driving you is not Christ. I will go back to the book of Proverbs that we read. Go to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. 
verse 16. How do you know if what is driving you is not Christ? Proverbs 6, 16. These six things the Lord has. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. How do you know that what is driving you is not Christ? Number one, a proud look. This is time to check yourself. Do you have a proud look? How do you look at people? How do you look at things? Two, a lying tongue. When an unclean spirit is driving you, it shows in your tongue. The first one is attitude. It shows in your attitude. The second way it shows, it shows in your tongue. Mm. It's quiet now, very quiet today. The, the, the thought where you know, has that shed innocent blood. So, if what is driving you is not Christ, it will show in your relationship. Hands have to do with relationship. Do you understand me? It will show in the kinds of people around you. Do you understand what I'm saying today? Huh? Number, eight, number 18. He said, a heart that defies wicked plans, that devises wicked plans. So if Christ, if what is driving you is not Christ, each time you are alone, you produce what the Bible calls vain imaginations. You can devise wicked things in your heart. You can strip somebody who is not naked. To you, you have seen him naked. What is driving you is not Christ. How many of you understand what I'm saying? You get my point? What's driving you is not Christ. It's an unclean spirit driving you. So if you close your eyes in death, you cannot make heaven. Please be told the truth. Are you understanding me? The Bible says they have devised wicked schemes. There are people that can plan any wicked thing. As soon as a teenager gets pregnant and the person is panicking and comes to them, they will say, don't worry, I will advise you. They know which drug to take. They are very foolish in everything, but not in doing wickedness. When it comes to aborting of children, they are professors. They know what drug to take, what to do to kill that unborn generation. Had that device wicked plans. They know how to plan. You see, there are people who are foolish in doing the right thing, but intelligent in doing the wicked thing. Do you understand what I'm talking about? They are very intelligent. They can lie in such a way. Have you ever seen a Dundee, a fool, who can lie intelligently? What is driving the person is a demon. It's not Christ. Had that device wicked plans. He now said, feet that are swift in running to evil. That is a sign that what is driving you is not Christ. Number 19. He said, a false witness who speak lies. And one who sows discord among brethren. So when somebody sowing discord, Christ is not in the person. What is driving that person is an unclean spirit. Are you understanding me? Sad enough, you can see the description in the church. Sad enough. So the second question to ask yourself to be able to know who is living in you is write this down. All okay, not a question really, it's a statement. Write this down. Whoever lives in you will be the one wearing you like a cloth. Whoever lives in you will be the one doing what? Wearing you like a cloth. Do you understand these things? Do you remember when God manifested in Jesus and came on earth and he gathered his disciples and he gave them communion? He gave Judas holy communion and the Bible says, and Satan enters him. Satan wore him like a cloth and took him to go and betray Jesus. If the unclean lives in you, it wears you like a garment. Are you understanding me? You cannot be able to do what is right. You always do what is evil. The next question, in the next statement that will help you know who lives in you is whoever lives in you will be the one to determine where you live in the spirit realm. Whoever lives in you 
will be the one to determine where you live in the spirit realm. So you now check your spiritual atmosphere. The Bible says in Psalm 90 that God has been our habitation in all generations. So if you are living in God in the spirit realm, you cannot live in sin. Do you understand know I me? Mean? So when somebody is living in sin, that person is not having Christ in him. So if you have Christ in you, you cannot live in sin. For instance, a so-called pastor, a so-called Christian cannot be comfortable living with a woman that is not married to her, a man she's not married to, and you call that Christianity. You cannot live in sin if you live in God in the spirit realm. Do you understand me? So if you are living in sin and you claim to be living in God, you are lying because God is holy. People who live in the holy God, they live a holy life. So this will help you understand who live in you. Number four, that will help you understand is this. Whoever lives in you will ultimately determine where you spend eternity. Whoever live in you will ultimately determine where you spend eternity. Look at the book of Revelation chapter 20. What the Bible says will happen at the great white throne judgment. This is where every mankind on earth, apart from those who have truly accepted Jesus, this is where they are going to end. Revelation 20 from verse 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled. Mm. Do you see Jesus? There was no found and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened. Who is the book of life? And the dead were judged according to their works. By the things which were written in the book, the sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Death then dead and hate were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, verse 15. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast where? Into the lake of fire. So if Christ lives in you, your name will appear in the book of life. But if another thing lives in you, your name will not be there. So that's why I say, whoever lives in you, determine where you spend eternity. Do you understand me? And the last thing I want to share with you before we pray is this. I want to show you how life after salvation needs to be. Life after salvation decision. There are three major things you must overcome. There are three major things you must overcome. After you have made salvation decision. Or else you will end up in hell as a Christian. Three major things you must overcome on daily basis. Do you understand me? Three major things you must overcome on daily, tell me daily basis. Every day, at this every week, at this every month, at this every year, you must overcome them on daily basis. Number one, you must overcome the world. You must overcome the world. When we say the world, W-O-R-O-L-D, we are talking about the evil and corrupt system of this world. Do you understand me? The evil and corrupt system of this world, that is the first thing you must overcome on daily basis, or else your Christianity will not end you in heaven. Be be good, I mean, beautifully speaking, the Bible says this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. What kind of faith? It's not empty faith. It's talking about the faith that has character. The faith that has character, not the faith of demons. The faith of demons is a faith that has no character. We're talking about the faith that has the character of God. Do you understand me? That is a faith that will overcome the world. If you look at that faith in the book of Hebrew, chapter 11, you see terrific men, how they rejected the world and they accepted Jesus. Some of them were sold into two. Some of them live in caves. Are you understanding me? Some of them lose, lost their jobs. Some of them lost their lives because of this very faith we are talking about. This is the faith 
that overcome the world is you looking at the face of Jesus and telling the devil you cannot have me are you understanding me that is the faith is you looking at the face of Jesus and telling loss pride you can't have me are you understanding me that is the faith so you must overcome the world number two you must overcome the flesh on daily basis after your salvation decision if you don't overcome the flesh on daily basis you will lose your salvation all those crazy liars who say once saved forever saved they are the mortuary attendants the spiritual mortuary attendants who are preparing men for hell preaching the gospel that they ought not to preach are you understanding me you must understand if you have given your life to Christ you don't overcome the world you don't overcome the flesh on daily basis when you close your eyes you end up in death so look at what Jesus said in Matthew 16 verse 24 then Jesus said to his disciples if anyone desires to come after me do you see it let him do what deny himself and take up his cross and follow me say I hear let him deny the flesh of his cravings let him deny himself of the kind of passions of the flesh you cannot be satisfying your flesh and satisfy God at the same time it don't work together are you understanding me so those people who are masturbating what is masturbating masturbation is satisfying the craving of the, the sexual craving of the flesh alone without anybody with you and some stupid people say it's not a sin well let's get to heaven let the judge of all speak they will know what is a sin and what is not and good enough he has already spoken in the world are you understanding what i'm talking about i remember the story we read about lazarus and the rich man what did, what happened they all went to hell i mean they all went to the next life lazarus was in heaven the rich man was in hell when he got to hell for you to know that when people go to hell they are still the same there's no difference it's just your body that dropped here it's still you you remember the school you went everything you remember so all the senses would there be will be there with you in fact death death does not really diminish anything death is simply it's like removing your clothes and coming out of it so there is still life after that you get my point that's how they call it transition it's you coming out of your body you are still it's still you so the rich man was there in the grave and look at what he was telling Abraham oh send Lazarus to come and give me some water Abraham said no there's a big gulf we can't cross though we, though we can see ourselves but we can't cross and I said okay can you send him to go to the earth and tell my brothers and what Abraham said he said Moses is there the prophets are there what is Moses when the Bible says Moses is dead, he's talking about the first, the first five books of Moses. Genesis, talk to me, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That is the Moses. All these preachers will tell you the Old Testament is not important. And, and eternity is saying Moses is there. Let's listen to him. He now said the prophets are there. Who are the prophets? All the books, Jeremiah, Isaiah. You get my point? Hosea, all of them. He said they are there. What Paul wrote, everything is there. And what did the Bible say? The, uh, Abraham told him, if they will not listen to the prophet, even if somebody dies, even if somebody resurrects and tell them, they will still not listen. But you know what? God even went far enough to make somebody to resurrect. His name is Jesus Christ. He came out of the grave and he's talking to us today through his genuine prophets, his genuine apostles, his genuine pastors, his genuine evangelists, and yet the world is not listening. Are you understanding me? May you not be part of those that will not listen to the voice of God. In the name of Jesus, we must overcome the world. We must overcome the flesh. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, join the church. No. Look for a pastor. No, it's good to join a church. It's good to look for a pastor. He said, Let him deny himself and take up his cross. What's the cross? The listen, the worldly penalty for serving Jesus. Because the world will penalize you. Do you hear what I say? The world will do not penalize you for serving Jesus. And Jesus said, Carry it and follow me. 
deny the flesh and follow me look at verse 25 for whoever desire to save his life watch listen it is the flesh that desires to save life is that not to save itself it doesn't say whoever desires to save his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will do what will find it for what is of what for what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul or what will a man give in exchange for his soul the flesh will tell you gain the whole world lose your soul in fact it will say you don't lose the soul the soul is still intact you just gain the whole world are you understanding me we must overcome the flesh on daily basis look at what the bible says in the book of galatians chapter 5 these are the things we must overcome on daily basis Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 I said then walk in the spirit see I hear so every day you must walk where in the spirit not in the flesh or else that salvation decision it will not help you I'm showing you the life to live after salvation decision. Do you understand me? You walk in the spirit, not the flesh. You know, say, and you shall not fulfill the loss of the flesh. For the flesh lost against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Verse 18. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Tell your neighbor, overcome the flesh. I didn't hear you say, overcome the flesh. So we must overcome the world on daily basis. We must overcome the flesh on daily basis. Number three, we must overcome the devil. On daily basis. Of course, prophetically, we have overcome the devil. Prophetically. <laughs> but can I be very, very explicit? I'm very clear. If you ask me, demystify the devil, I will tell you the devil can be demystified into three spirits. Number one, the spirit of hell. Number two, the spirit of death. And number three, the spirit of grave. The spirit of hell, the spirit of what? Death. And the spirit of what? grave so we may put it as an acronym hell death grave H G G. do you understand me we must so that that is this is how to demystify the devil because every attack of the devil are launched through the three spirits hell death or grave the day God showed me this thing, it pained my heart that so called deliverance ministers don't know. They tell you who's Kupus or Sukumbus. Is it Sukumbus they're calling? I'm, I'm, I'm learning gradually. You get my point? Hell, dead, grave. No monitoring spirit. Every day they teach you to bind monitoring spirit. One day you will look for monitoring lizard and also bound it. You get my point? They tell you to bind the spirit of rejection. They manufacture spirits that don't really exist. There are three major spirits we are confronting. Hell, death, and grief. Nothing else. Have you ever seen the word spirit of rejection in the Bible? But you will see hell. You will see death. You will see grief. Hosea tells us about grief and death. I will show you Matthew 16 tells us about hell. We will go there shortly. Listen carefully. So if we want to overcome the devil, we must recognize these three spirits. We, these are what, this is what we face on a daily basis. Every child of God, you face these spirits on a daily basis. But look at what Jesus said. He said in Matthew 16, go there quickly. In Matthew 16, verse 18, look at what he said. And I also said to you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Show me the gates of hell. 
That is the, hate means hell. So why did he say the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? He didn't mention death. He didn't mention grave. Here is the reason. I will give you two reasons. The first reason is that he was going to the cross to conquer death. Hosea, sorry, Hebrew 2 tells us from verse 14. He was going to the cross to conquer death. And he's going to come out of the grave to conquer grave. Do you understand me? The second reason why he didn't talk about death and grave is simple. If you have not overcome the spirit of hell, then the spirit of death and grave will overcome you. So if you can handle the spirit of hell, then you can overcome the spirit of death and grave. When are we overcoming the spirit of death and grave? The day the rapture will take place and will break out of our graves. That the man is too weak. You see, such things are only celebrated by genuine Christians, not slaves, not hypocrites. Because our greatest joy is the day we are going to hear the sound of the trumpet and leave this wicked world forever and be in the ages to come for eternity to eternity. Are you understanding me? So that day that the rapture will take place, if Jesus tarries, we all die and we are buried. So the day the trumpet will sound and you and I will come out of our graves, then we will conquer death and grave forever. But for now, what we need to be in constant battle with is hell. So when the Bible says overcoming the devil is overcoming the spirit of hell. False prophets are powered by the spirit of hell. The Antichrist is the spirit of hell personified. Every preacher who tells you you are suffering because you are firstborn? He's operating by the spirit of hell. Everyone who tells you you should sow seed and give money for a breakthrough or a miracle is suffering by the spirit of is powered by the spirit of hell. Every false prophet who display demonic similitude, prophetic witchcraft that they call prophetic ministry, giving you oil to drink, giving you salt to use in prayer, asking to bring sand from your village, telling you to go and bring mustard seed or use it in prayer, or give you some special waters. Give you some special things to pray with. They are under the spirit of hell. How do you know a church that is under the spirit of hell? When you go, they will tell you, bring water for prayer. So while you are going to church, you bring water in a bottle, oil, everything. Line it up on the pulpit like this. And you write your prayer point and attach. Write everything. So when you enter the church, you get confused. You don't know whether it's a shrine. Or is a stage. Do you understand me? And they will tell you to leave the water for like one week or how many days. Then you can come and carry it. It has become holy. That is a church powered by the spirit of hell. The basic character of a church powered by the spirit of hell. It is either operated as a money making machine. A metaphysical cult. A social club. A political party. Or a place of theatrical performance. Where they call music worship the cause creep and fleshy manifestation worship that when you are in their press session they end up staring your sexuality than your spirituality those who lead in songs half of their press is outside now if only is the press that is outside will be comfortable but the laps I also outside and you know a young man no matter how holy ghost filled you are if you keep coming to a church that every time you come you see half breast and see half laps one day you will collapse on the laps of a woman that's the spirit of hell that's why such pastors sleep with those girls it's the spirit of hell because hell's agenda is to make sure you don't make heaven. Hell's agenda is to pull you away from God's presence. Anytime you discover a church moving in the Holy Ghost, hell will move somebody to pull you out of that church. Hell does not want you to be active 
actively involved with Jesus. Hell will tell you, hell will call sin weakness. Hell will tell you, oh, you have overcome the world. Why you are living like the world? Hell will tell you, oh, you have overcome the flesh. Why you live in the flesh? Hell will tell you, you have overcome the devil. Why you are in the devil's pocket? Are you understanding me? Hell will give you prayer points to talk to God. Instead of giving you the prayer spirit, hell will keep you comfortable in religion without relationship with Jesus. Hell will make you more enemy conscious than God conscious because hell knows that they that know their God shall be strong and to exploit but those that does not know their God shall be weak and they'll be exploited hell will give you a very ignorant corrupt pastor but very rich because he knows you need money are you understanding me? Hell will give you every reason to remain in a dead church. It will tell you all oh, kinds. In fact, that is why it will quote scripture. Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In the days to come, I will show you what the gates of hell are. Apart from the five senses that are not connected to the Holy Ghost, the gates of hell are religious leaders who are sold to money sold to other things to them ministry is a means of making money it's of a means of helping people to make heaven when they see you they only think about the amount of money that can come out of you that's why i see some christians because of such exploitations they are afraid to talk about their financial conditions i was talking to somebody and the person was hiding the financial condition and I, I just love in my heart I said look at this person you're asking me to give you advice here yeah, you don't want to tell me how can I advise you you think I'm one of those tips I have connected a lot of people with a lot of things I've seen people that are richer than everybody here in this country I've seen them I've met them I've sat down with them I've sat down with people minister to people that own banks I didn't say they own money banks they own houses both in Nigeria and the Middle East. I have sat with them and I ministered to them for two days. I didn't ask them for one naira. Is it some chicken little money in your bank? But I won't blame you because maybe you have met thieves that as soon as you talk the kind of money they have, they start prophesying. Are you understanding me? We have such wicked gates of hell in the body of Christ. But the Bible says, Jesus will build us up. And the gates of hell shall not what? prevail against us. So that is a sign that we are going to be in constant battle with hell. So you must know that after your salvation decision, the first thing that you must fight every day, the world, the flesh, and the devil. When we say the devil, is not the altar of your father's house. It's not the evil foundation and the demons in your household. We are talking about the spirit of hell. Because if hell have not hurt you, other spirit can never have you. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Are you understanding me this morning? So if you want to go to the heaven that Jesus went to, you must fight what? The world. You must not be a friend of the world. Because friendship with the world is enmity with God. You must fight the flesh. You must not walk in the flesh. And you must oppose the devil every day. Don't condone hell. David one day told God, I don't even accommodate people who are wicked towards you. Do you understand me? I'm not a friend of agents of hell. I detest them. I stay only around your sons. There are sons of hell everywhere. We must not become one of them. In closing, God gave us one heavenly institution on earth for us to successfully overcome the battle with, of the world, our battle with the world, our battle with the flesh, and our battle with the devil. That institution was revealed in first Timothy quickly open your Bible as we bring this to a close first Timothy chapter 4 sorry chapter 3 first Timothy chapter 3 verse 14 these things are right to you hallelujah though I hope to come to you shortly if we can translate this prophetically, we can say, 
These teachings we have had today came from Jesus because it's coming quickly. It's coming shortly. Are you understanding me? He now said, but if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. Which is what? The church of the living God. The pillar and ground of what? Of truth. So do you see where you need to go to? The institution that God set on earth to help us is called the church of the living God. The pillar and ground of truth. Not a money making machine. Not a metaphysical call. So if you say you are born again and you are in a wrong church, sorry, you cannot make heaven. If you say you are born again and you don't go to church, you just sit at home. That is itself is a sign that you are not going to heaven. In fact, you are not yet part of the body of Christ because nobody can be part of the body and sit at home and say you want to cultivate your relationship with God. Who told you? He gave five-fold ministry gift to perfect you on this journey, to equip you on this journey. One of the blessings that God will ever give you as a child of God is a pastor after his heart. That's what he promised in scriptures. He said, I will give you a pastor after my heart. We will feed you after your, we will feed you with knowledge and understanding. You need such institutions of heaven on earth, a church of the living God, for you to grow. Overcome the world, overcome the flesh, and overcome the devil. Not every church, not the bulls of the dragon we call churches. You need a place the Bible called the pillar and ground of truth. Look at what the Bible says in the next world. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. So you need a church where the mystery of godliness is revealed. Are you understanding me? What is the mystery of godliness? God was manifested in the flesh. Do you see number one statement? So that means I, I need a church where Christ will be formed in me. Look at what Paul said. He said, my little children, who oh, might travail in birth until Christ is forming me. These are not days of going to a church because the bishop is from your tribe. Yeah. You are stupid. Yeah. These are not days of going to a church because they speak your language or they are from your nationality. If you are in the kingdom, tribes and nationality disappear. These are not days of going to a church because they pay your rent. These are not days you go to a church because it is close to your house. You go to a church that is close to your house and it keeps you very close to hell. You don't go to church to fulfill your righteousness. You don't go to church so that they will not say you sit at home. We go to church to be made ready for the next life. Because this life is temporal. A day is coming that the silver cord will be disconnected. When that silver cord is disconnected, your body, your spirit will leave your body. You will come out and see your body. It could be lying down in your room. It could be lying down in the hospital or even in your car or anywhere. You will just come out. How will you end after that? That's why we go to church. We go to church to be prepared for the next life. Because this life is temporal. That's what the Bible says. Upon Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance and holiness. And the sons of Jacob shall possess their possession. Are you understanding me? If you have made a decision for Christ, the next thing you need, you need an institution from heaven called church. We are the world will be dealt with. You'll be given a cupid to overcome the world, given a cupid to overcome the flesh, given a cupid to deal with hell. Are you understanding me? Why we spend hours in our church is because I know what God sent me to attack. He sent me to attack the spirit of hell. We can overcome hell until we stay in God's presence long enough. Hell is a spirit. Hell is a situation. Hell is a person. Hell is also a place. Are you understanding me? It is the spirit that takes men to the place. But if we attach ourselves to this heavenly institution on earth where there is truth, where there is grace, then we can overcome hell. I pray that God will use these words to build you up and give you a righteous inheritance. Among them that are sanctified, rise on your feet. Hmm, what a word from our God.
You have been listening to the cry of the spirit today, the prophetic and apostolic ministry of Richard E. Esther King. Coming to you from the Apostolic Center of the Cry of the Spirit Ministries in Nairobi. For the complete package of this message, further information about the ministry, Apostle Takim's books, Riding on Covenant Wings, Overcoming Witchcraft by the Greatness of God's Power, and You Shall Not Be Poor, or More Encounters with God, call the church office on 706 370 706-370-793. Yes! Experience the prophetic and apostolic teaching ministry of Apostle Takim every Sunday, 8.30 a.m. and Wednesdays and Fridays, 5 p.m. for solid discipleship programs. The venue is the Apostolic Center of the Cry of the Spirit Ministry, 680 Hotel, Kenyatta Avenue, Nairobi. Please visit our website at www.cotsmonline.org. That is www.cotsmonline.org. You can also interact with him personally on his Facebook page, Richard E. Esther Kim Apostle. Or better yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Richard E. Esther Kim. Jesus is Lord. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish thee. Do not forget to tune in to this station next Sunday, same time.